say, oh, look at this. Another guy with the same name and date of birth shows up in this news article about this other incident with a bomb and a hostage situation and a threat to his mother. And look, his mother's same name too. Well, let's look this up in the online court database and see if it comes up. Hit the, hit the clicking. <laughs> hit the typewriter. They're clicking away, and they can't find anything. And so as soon as – and you, know, you notice it's, it's going on one day. Two, we still don't know if it's the same guy. We're looking online. We can't find it. So I tell people, and say, hey, listen, when you see this kind of thing, when you still can't determine the disposition of a case after this much time, okay – uh, that's because there's been some kind of intervention. Uh, there's been some kind of intervention where the uh, the defendant is an informant and they came in and they sealed up the case. Or there's some kind of political intervention. You got a buddy on the DA's team there, some money's changing hands. Or there's some kind of intelligence uh, connections that they come in and they make things go away. Now, when I see these things, in the course of my work as a criminal defense investigator, uh, my first observation here would be, you know, if, if I have a client um, and this is a co-defendant, okay, and I find this previous case that disappeared, I would say to my client, well, it looks like this person may have cooperated with the police prior to his association with you. You need to be careful of this gentleman because he's the kind of guy that turns on his buddies and he rats out his friends and he rats out his partners. Upon further investigation, and here we see that his grandfather is a right-wing January 6th MAGA uh, mayor in California. So perhaps that's some kind of political pull, and maybe he pulled these strings. It's still possible the guy was an informant because he's got a mother who's a jailbird. And then it turns out it gets even better. He's got a father uh, named Aaron Brink who's a former mixed martial arts fighter who was featured on the TV show Intervention. Now, when I hear this, because, you know, when things like this happen, people start sending me information like crazy all over the place. You have no idea, okay? Um, and plus, I have my core uh, group of friends out there and fellow um, podcasters and fellows uh, who, you know, want to discuss these things with me and run things by me. So I hear a lot of stuff. So that we hear that this guy's an, an MMA fighter that was featured on Intervention, and the title of the show, <laughs> well, what are the captions for the show? was that after he shoots up methamphetamine, he goes and under a, a sleeping bag and masturbates for 12 hours. <laughs> or it was like 10 to 12 hours. Okay, and then I went looking for this, you know, masturbates 12 hours, you know, intervention. How hard would that be to find, right? You go look for this. And uh, the only thing you could find was a guy's cell phone video pointed at his, at his TV set. You couldn't find the original intervention TV show. So then I start figuring out, okay, what was the year... Okay, well then what year was, uh, what season was that? Was season seven? I, I figure it out. I find the episode on the a &E website. But it was, it was very, and I, I've searched for these things before. It was very, very difficult to find, which tells me that A&E, when they heard about this guy was in the news, they removed the tags, uh, the, the search engine optimization tags for that episode that it wouldn't come up easily in a search. You had to actually figure out which episode it was and then go find it by episode, which is how I found it. Uh, because everyone out there was just posting this handheld um, iPhone video of this incident. So that's a very interesting development there, too. Then when I interviewed the MMA fighter, who's now a retired MMA fighter, and also a porn star, a former porn star, over a thousand films, um, turns out he says, oh, yeah, I, I taught my son to hate gays, and I taught my son to use violence, and violence is an effective tool with things, and, and I can't believe my son is gay. We're Mormon, <laughs> you know? And so, oh, my son's not gay? Oh, great. And it turns out the kid also too changed his name because he didn't want any association with this mixed martial arts guy and his behavior on intervention. They masturbated for 10 hours. So, you know, Father's Day of this year is going to be lonely for Mr. Aaron Brink. But what a what a messed up family this is. The, the father's got criminal problems, too. The father's a um, new wife. He also got into porn. She seems to be a stable woman out of this whole crew. But here you have a, a life uh, of tragedy that ends in uh, uh, horrifically in even greater tragedy. You know, uh, It's the case of... Uh, 
is. Oh, by the way, too, it was the same thing with Daryl Brooks. Okay, as soon as I saw that the head up, there was the, 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 the prosecutor in the case kept saying, there's another case out there, Your Honor, and we can't figure out the disposition on it. Whenever you start saying that, that means that there's something's being sealed, there's something hinky. And when the prosecution kept bringing that up in court, saying we can't figure out the disposition of that other case, they are sending a signal to the guys in prison waiting for Mr. Brooks, saying that guy coming in there is a rat. Now, Brooks has his own problems because he has another case pending right now where he identified as a crip, and it turns out he's not actually a crip. So he's going to have problems, too, with the crips <laughs> when he gets to prison. So he's not in for a, uh, a good time, either one of these fellows here. Okay. Porn on YouTube. Oh, yeah. oh, hey, you know, really weird. Okay, this is, I put a little note here, porn on YouTube. I've had, uh, uh, I mean, Twitter. I've had Twitter for a long, long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I used to be an a internet affiliate marketer uh, with my website, emailrevealer.com. That's how I used to generate leads by making people affiliates. Uh, so I was uh, into promoting my, my website. And um, so when Twitter was invented, I was on Twitter the first week. I have an account, you know, Email revealer at Opperman. Opperman, you know, the Opperman report came years later. That's the one I use now. But I have these accounts on there for years. And I've never even known that there was porn on Twitter at all. I had never, I had never run across porn on Twitter. And now all of a sudden, in my feed, I'm getting these porn things. Uh, you know, not people I'm following or anything like that, but I guess because people I, I follow are, are retweeting or, or like them or what. I don't know how that's working. Uh, but uh, suddenly, um, and it's pretty graphic porn, too. So I've never seen porn on Twitter before Elon Musk took over. So I don't know. Maybe there's something going on with him. Maybe he's following all these sites because I follow him. Okay, so the story tonight is we're going to be talking about Dave McGowan. Now, we had some very, uh, this is the, the week of the anniversary of a passing of our good friend, Dave McGowan. Um, he died on November 22nd, the same day that John F. Kennedy died. Um. Now, every now and then, I'll play a Dave McGowan marathon. All the episodes, all the interviews I've done with Dave McGowan, I'll play them in a row. And I did that again this year. Um, but something really unusual happened this year on November 22nd. I had been contacted by a woman about two weeks ago. On Instagram, okay? Now, usually when people contact me on Instagram, I, I don't have time to respond to everyone, but she had noticed some um, uh, Selby Gardens and, and Botanical Garden and things on my Instagram. She says, oh, Ed, I've been there too. You know, I love that place. I'm a member there, so and we started chatting about that. And as we began talking, uh, it became clear that she was involved in a religious cult. And she was describing different things about her faith and her religion and stuff like that. And um, I said, well, let me take a look into this. And it, it's related to another cult uh, called the um, Life Daily Army, uh, Daily Life Army, something like that. And so then when I started searching for more information about that cult, which by that, that's an admitted cult. These people admit they're a cult. And it's a very bizarre cult. Um, I, I found a, a YouTube channel with a very nice young lady. It's very intelligent, an uh, artist, you know, trained artist. And uh, here she is now. She's devoted her life to this cult and, and their way of thinking, their way of beliefs. And when I listened to the very first interview on November 22nd, the first thing she says in that first video is she starts talking about Dave McGowan and weird scenes inside the camp and his theory about uh, military intelligence running the 60s, the movement of the 60s. And so when I saw that, I sent her a note. I says, hey, you know, Dave McGowan was a friend of mine. Do you know that today's, oh, I just stumbled on your thing today. Did you know that today's the day of his passing? So I haven't heard back from her, but I've been listening to all her videos. And what struck me is that she's taken this information from Dave, who I believe is an brilliant researcher and you have to remember too when dave first came on my show the first year i was doing a show because i knew about him previous to uh, being on the air um he's someone i always wanted to get on the air and speak to and i met him through the radio show but before i brought him on my show he wasn't a widely known guy before i brought him on this show 
I had been on uh, Coast to Coast. I had been on John B. Wells. I had been on many shows. And I brought him up. I mentioned his theory on all these shows. And no one ever heard of him. You know, maybe they heard of him by me mentioning him on those shows. But he had only done a few YouTube interviews at the time. So at the time, when I first had him on the show, he wasn't a widely known name. Uh, and then I had him on the show several times. He became a much more widely known name. And then other hosts on my station uh, couldn't book him because he wouldn't go on their stupid shows. <laughs> but they talked about his book and they interviewed people who read the book. It was the funniest thing. So it kind of disturbs me when I play these repeats and people who never met Dave never met either of his brothers you know he has two brothers not just the one brother Craig who's been on my show he had another brother who tried to make contact with me he sent me his phone number I tried calling him back several times he never um, responded never took the calls left the messages and I guess he just wanted to drop things um, but people who never met Dave and only know him from maybe listening on YouTube uh, recordings of interviews with him will definitively state on my channel Dave McGowan was murdered that's a fact you don't know nobody knows okay um he did he was a smoker you know uh I have things with my health right now I could be gone in six months from today okay my health is very very bad right now okay uh so there's no definitive conclusion to that. I know that his one brother is very suspicious. He feels guilty, as a matter of fact, um, because there was a, a person in his life that they were suspicious of who suddenly came into his life. And there were other factors, too, as well, and some that I was aware of. Uh, a lot of people talk about how there was this threat about these people saying, you know, it was a, a debate over the Beatles, you know, the fake Beatles. And um, a... a, a, a Veiled threat was made, hey, you're going to find yourself with a quick acting cancer, you know. And uh, he was concerned about these people enough that he did contact me about locating and identifying these people. But I, I just thought it was internet uh, chatter and trolling because Dave did tend to troll with people too, you know. Uh, so the, the, there's that whole matter of this uh, allegations that it was a murder that you can't definitively say that it was a murder. Um. But if you if you if you're willing to accept the fact that it, it very is possible that this was an assassination, to silence somebody who did very serious work and someone who was directly in direct communication with Michael Aquino, he has correspondence with, with Aquino, which means that Aquino knew who he was and he knew who was Aquino was. I've had correspondence with Aquino. Aquino knew who I was. Okay, knew thoroughly who I was. Okay, working with different clients in different situations. Now. When I first started doing the show that first year, uh, that first show in September, things were going pretty good for me. You know, we had settled my uh, um, financial stuff with my divorce. Um, the, the real problems didn't come up till she had about 13 years old. And we tried to get another day of visitation uh, over here. We had 50 50, and. Um, we just wanted one more day, and then all hell broke loose, man. We were in court for the next 10 years. Um, it was a nightmare situation. Um, but as soon as I started doing my little radio show and bringing people on, like Dave McGowan and like Henry Vinson, who was the D.C. madam in the Franklin cover-up case, when I interviewed people like Nick Bryan, who wrote the book about Franklin cover-up, when I interviewed people like um, uh, Tim Tate, who did the conspiracy of silence? No one had been interviewing these people, okay? So much so I mean, now it's all common. It's all everybody's talking about this stuff now. But at the time, it was very, very rare and unusual for someone to be talking about these topics, also talking about politics and talking about true crime, and talking about these power political situations. Peter Dale Scott, having these people, kind of people on my show. Uh, Lorenzo Kumbawa Irvin, who was a Black Panther Party for self-defense, who hijacked a plane and got into a shootout in Algiers. Incredible story. Uh, Mark Rudd from the Weather Underground. People from involved with the, the, the Falcon and the Snowman case. You know, the organized group, Frank Collada. I remember when I, when I first created a, a Twitter account for Opperman Report, every one of my, I only had like 80 Twitter friends, 
but they were all like organized crime, spies, John Kirkow.